Hello everyone, welcome to the Game Design Perspective. I'm Santi, I'm a senior game designer in the game industry. But years ago, I used to be a mission designer at Ubisoft Toronto, where I had the chance to work in open world games, the most prolific one being Far Cry 6. And I think that a lot of people enjoy the open world setup of video games, but at the same time, a lot of people don't like it. It's fair enough, but very little is talked about how they're actually made. So this is why I wanted to talk about it, at least how Ubisoft made them and how the Ubisoft formula has translated because Ubisoft was kind of like the first company to kind of popularize open world and a lot of the techniques that we use to make open worlds come from Ubisoft. Uh, we all know the famous towers, right? This DNA for the open world runs deeper than just towers and uh, outposts. It runs quite deep in the industry and how open world games were made. So how about we go through them? The first thing that open world games have to define is that if they have to go instance or seamless. An instance is when you load a map and you have to unload the rest. So in order to do that, you cut the player from the game and you usually put a loading screen. And then in that loading screen, you delete the previous map and you bring the new map forward. It's a traditional way of doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. Great games like The Witcher 3 did it, like here, like the Skellige Isles and Belen and Novigrad. There were like separate instances, right? You couldn't just swim into the Skellige Isles. You would go through a loading. You have to go through a menu to see it. And then there's maps. This is the map of Far Cry 6. And there are maps that are similar these maps go from one point to the other and there's no loading screens and there's no unloading of the map or not the map stays consistent there are games that hide their instances through elevators or other setups like cinematics but the reality is that there are instances you're unloading and loading a separate map uh, what's the difference for the player if they are stuck in an elevator or if it's just a loading screen yeah one you keep control but how much right you're stuck in a room while you're teleported into a new map Elden Ring is really good at this. The underground world is hidden through an elevator, but don't be fooled. This is actually a new instance. You're unloading the previous map and loading a new one. And it's even a new skybox. It's a new, like everything is new when you go into one map to the other. So this is like the first thing you would like to do in, a, in an open world game. The second thing is like, this is the map of Far Cry 6 again. And the first thing is that you delimit areas in it. Far Cry 6 is delimited in this way, right? Like you have an area that is here and you have an area that is here. And then you have air like here and this is how far cry 6 is kind of delimited well here is included right but far cry 6 is delimited this way but why is far cry 6 if the map is seamless why is do you need still to have areas right like if you see a game like Zelda breath of the wild tell that breath of the wild is very specific it has areas there is a design decision because you might want to have like an ice area a desert area and stuff like that but if you think about it in far cry 6 the biome of the map is relatively the same across the game because it takes place in a fictionalized island based in cuba so the biomes tend to be the same, but we still separated the map in areas. If you see it is something like this. And the main reason these areas are separated in open world games is management. The reality is that open world games tend to like be a huge entertaining for environment artists and level designers. So in order to improve collaboration and improve the performance, to improve teamwork in general, you have to go through this separation in areas. For example, here, this specific area in the map in Far Cry 6, right here, this area was made by Ubisoft Montreal, not Ubisoft Toronto. That allowed that team to have their own area, tell their own story and like have their own missions and collaborate within themselves and also collaborate with us, but it just improved communication overall. So my area specifically was here. I work in this area and this area. So that was like the main areas I, I worked on in Far Cry 6. And this is more of a management thing that is needed, not necessarily like a technical issue. Uh, you can use this to design advantage and your design advantage like Zelda does or Cineblade does or a, many open worlds do this, but many times it's just for the team to focus in a specific area. This is the, the first step, but 
not the only step of making open world games. So if we go and continue, there is all open worlds, especially seamless ones, but all open worlds are based on three layers. We can figuratively talk that they're made by in three layers. The first one is the art layer. So the art layer is the visual aspect of the open world. These are the forests, the like the mountains, the rivers. Here is the thing. The art layer is persistent. This, the player tends to not interact much with the art layer it's it's kind of like the visual persistence of the game you can change it like changing weather patterns and stuff like that that can can change some of it but all of it tends to have all the code and all the behavior tends to be in the shaders in this case so when it's wet when there's an explosion when it's burned that kind of stuff so this is the art layer and the number one thing is that is again persistent it does not unload or deload in real time especially in seamless open worlds it lets talk about an instance of an open world like the witcher and while you are in skelliga the art layer of skelliga is not going to unload at all the optimization of art layers tends to happen with measuring the distance of the player to certain points and then when the distance is enough you increase the topology and you increase the detail of art assets right so that's a different layer of optimization so optimization in open worlds comes in different kind of parallel roads working together so the art layer optimization tends to be that way. now on top of this the art layer you tend to have the object layer. So what you have to imagine is grab the map of any open world and then draw a grid of it, on it. So if you see here, every square is an object. And what do I mean by that? So every little square that you see here is its own object. And each ob that object holds the information of the objects within it. So let's say you open a, a chest in an open world. The chest is not going to be persistent. It's not going to be always loaded in your game. Otherwise, you will finish the RAM immediately. The chest is not going to be loaded all the time. This chest will only be loaded when you're in the... So let's imagine there is a square here. So we have a square here and the chest will be loaded only when you're around these squares. You don't need objects that have code to be loaded all the time. So now this chest that exists has different states. Is it open or is it closed? So the object's behavior, the object's state is recorded within a bigger object that is each and every one of these little squares that is like a, that form a grid in the open world. So when you put an object in the open world that is like open world that has behavior, that the open world will assign it to this little like block and keep it and, and keep the behavior there. And that's how the open world remembers your action in certain objects that are tagged to be remembered for your actions. Chest, certain are if you liberate an outpost in Far Cry, for example, in the object layer, you will have certain missions that they are called open world missions. So open world missions and these open world missions don't have the same behavior as like regular missions that tend to be like a lower scope little like kind of fetch quest all the collectibles that you will find they tend to not require ai or specific objectives in far cry 6 there is this propaganda that you have to destroy and it is spread around the whole world well this op this is considered an open world mission and as an open world mission it's not persistent it's just loaded when you're close to the block that is uh, referred to you but usually they have, tend to be also binary have you picked it up yes or no have you destroyed it yes or no why does this matter because it's a very simple information that you get that is stored within this block and remembered in your save file your profile is made a big part of your profile in open world games in your save file is made of the information and each of in each block in the open world and the state of each block in open world and the objects within it. So the objects that tend to be very simple, tend to be like a ch chest. Is it open? Yes or no? It tends to be propaganda, like a poster. Is it destroyed? Yes or no? Is it a collectible? Has it been collected? Yes or no? You know, so do I spawn it? Yes or no? Or do I spawn it open or closed? So it tends to be yes or no question. Yes or no objects because you don't want to make the, the object layer too heavy because it will really affect your performance because you're constantly calculating if you have this or not, depending on your position in the map. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in, ahead in the presentation. For now, let's move on. So we have the object layer and now we have the mission layer. So imagine another grid on top that is exactly the same as the previous one, but this one contains every single re bigger mission in the world, every single mission in the game or quest. The main point of having this mission layer on top of the object layer is that the mission layer can overthrow 
the object layer. So if the mission layer says, hey, the conditions of this mission are real, so there is a list of conditions in every open world game. There is a huge list of conditions. And this list of conditions says, okay, this mission is over, this mission is active. This mission is active because this and this has been achieved. So it's a list of conditions, a huge list of conditions that is added to your save file other than the grid that we talked before. So we have this huge list of conditions, right? Like, hey, did you talk to this guy? character. Hey, did you reach this point? Hey, did you finish this mission? All this, all this list of conditions is stored in your save file as well. From the beginning, when you create a profile. Why? Because you're like, when you start a game, everything is false, right? You haven't achieved anything. But as you start achieving some things, new missions get up, like uploaded, get released in a way. All the information, all the code, all the scripting, all the spawn points, all this kind of stuff is stored in the mission layer. And the mission layer, we're going to talk as well more a little bit later, but the mission every mission is defined in bits every mission has let's say bit one and this is your mission giver if you talk about the witcher when you're in a hunt you go talk to someone that tells you hey i need this monster destroyed this is the reward and you negotiate the reward that's your mission giver that's your bit one then you have bit two and you can have bit three bit four bit five you can have all this continuing and then you have the final bit that is when you succeed many times when you take a, a mission you have to go back to the mission giver and that's the final final bit of the mission and that's the final condition it says that hey you achieve what i wanted you achieve bit one bit two and think about it in in mission terms when you go into a quest in any game you go and they tell you hey go and defeat this monster oh this monster was defeated but it was not the one now you have to destroy this other monster or any fetch quest oh you go and grab this key from this chest oh now you go and open this door and find something inside oh what is inside bring it back to the mission giver. So those are bits. Every objective, every objective in the game is a new mission bit. And every mission bit gets assigned a specific block or blocks. The limit in Ubisoft, in Far Cry specifically, of blocks that a mission could have was nine. Any mission beat could have only nine blocks, max. But it was really encouraged to have less because the less blocks you have, the less you have to load, you know, the, the more contained it is. When you have a mission active, the place where that mission is taking place, it overlaps with the object layer, right? So the object layer is here and the mission layer is here. So if a mission is active, the mission layer deletes or overcomes whatever the object layer has there. Doesn't mean that they delete chests, not necessarily, but every AI or every systemic aspect that was happening in the object layer is gonna be overthrown for whatever is going to happen in the mission layer. So the mission layer takes the precedence because it's the story, right? It's the story, is the main objectives of, of the game. You want them to take precedence, right? So this is where mission designers work. Mission designers work here, creating code that it's only active when your mission is active. Going back, there's three layers. There is the art layer, the object layer, and the mission layer. So why we have this amount of layers and why do we need to necessarily separate the game in a grid? So we have here a grid. Let's begin by saying that the player is in this block and that player has a mission over here and this mission is four blocks here so they went to the quest giver and now they have to move in this way so as they move in that direction every block around like this every block selected in this area get, begins to get loaded as the player moves when they arrive to this area to where the mission blocks area are like available, the blocks replace the behavior of the game in those blocks specifically. If you leave those blocks, the behavior goes back to normal. It becomes, it goes back to a systemic aspect of the open world. The NPCs become systemic, everything becomes systemic. But while the mission is active and you are inside those blocks, the code knows to not load necessarily the object layer, but to also put the mission layer on top and whatever needs to be replaced is replaced. Now the player goes there, the behavior is what the level designer or the mission designer says is going to be there in that beat and then after that the objective is specifically as achieved you can go back to your quest giver and then let's say that's a mission mission over so that is one of the reasons why the open world is divided in a grid like this and every open world i'm pretty sure follows the same formula, every single one. A tower, what it does, let's say there's a tower here. What a tower is doing is communicating with the, the blocks around it, like so, and saying, hey, your objects 
in each one of them, your objects reveal them in the map. So that's how the towers communicate. The towers go, they take the information from those blocks and it's like your object list that you have recorded within you, put it in the map. And that's how your icons start to pop up. Boop, 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 boop. So that's how they work. And if you notice, it's very hard to see things loading and unloading because the object layer don't load anything art. It's just things with specific behavior. Then there is a final thing that I want to talk about. The reason why open worlds are divided in grids. And that is because the editor is aware of these grids. So me as a level designer where I'm working in the engine, back then when I was working it, if I wanted to load all Far Cry 6, I think my, my editor, my engine would take like 90 minutes to open. So imagine you go to work and you have to wait 90 minutes for your, for your computer to just to start so you can start working. So that's a long time, you know, like that's such a long time just to start working. So this division of grid serves also a development purpose. When I'm working on a mission, and I, let's say I have a quest giver here and my, and my mission beats are, let's say nine here. I don't need to load any other block than those, that those 10 blocks. In the case of you, so you have a map, exactly this map kind of with like the grid and you would select from a map the points that you wanted to load. The engine knows that these objects exist. So I would select the objects myself in the engine and then the engine would open significantly faster and significantly using less resources because I don't have to load all the map. And loading an engine to work in a game is not the same as loading the game itself in a console. There's significantly more resources when you're working in a game. There's significantly more tools and significantly more code running at the same time when you are working in an engine than if you're playing a build. That's why we make builds. So we get rid of all that extra stuff so the game can actually run. So if the case is like I'm running an engine because I need the behavior, I need the tools to work, then I'm not gonna load the whole map. I'm gonna load these and these sections and that's it because I don't need more you know but here's the thing oh if you're play testing your mission and you spawn here and you walk this way you will fall through the floor because there is not a world that exists outside of those you will find several tools or development developer helpers or developer menus that we see in games a lot right like hey developer commands right well one of the developers commands would be like hey let's just fly there and you can fly there or teleport there and teleport wherever you want and you can say hey teleport me to this to this square this one here so because you can teleport there you can go okay go to a mission giver and then just test your mission where you need it so you don't need to load more than that right so this is why open world games are developed on a grid hopefully this is some what informative if you have any question put it in the comments we're trying to make shorter videos so i'm gonna end it here this is not the whole subject open world game development is like incredibly deep but this is kind of the beginning you know this grid this object grid and mission grid are the basics of open world development but there's a lot more so if you're interested in the subject let me know in the comments like subscribe and see you guys next time welcome to game design perspective thank you for watching peace